Hey everyone, uh, before we start today's episode, I wanted to quickly tell you about the membership drive that I am doing on patreon.com slash fire these times to celebrate over two years of this podcast. If we hit the goal of 100 new supporters at $5 or more a month or 50 a year, I'll be able to hire a producer, which would give me more time to focus on the research and interviews and actually start releasing two episodes a week instead of one. If you become a supporter, in addition to getting early access to all episodes, you will also have access to our monthly hangout in which myself and everyone else who supports this project come together and chat about pretty much everything. Um, It happens every month on a Saturday and you have access to the link and everything related to that uh, on Patreon. And lastly, if you cannot donate, you can still support by sharing this podcast with your friends and families and leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you get your podcasts. This helps get more exposure to this podcast and introduce it to more folks. You can also follow this podcast and project on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Substack, and of course, the main website. So thanks again, everyone, and I hope you enjoy this conversation. Hi, my name is Maryam Nayam. I am from Ukraine, but I'm from Afghan origin. Um, I was studying culture, so I basically want to call myself culture study or person. Um, but right now I'm working as a UX designer, but I guess here uh, the most important that I'm Ukrainian and I'm um, my family's there and my brother was at war for the last couple of months. I'm Romy Kukratsky. I'm a journalist here in Ukraine. And I am also the co-host of the Ukraine Without Hype podcast. So I wanted to have both of you on uh, when Mariam and uh, Romeo is going to help me co-host as we've been doing with the Ukraine related uh, episodes so far on the podcast to sort of have a pretty open ended conversation as 80 percent of these episodes are kind of reflections on what's been happening, um, what we might what we think might happen next, you know, that sort of thing. And also kind of talk um, around the topic or on the topic around the topic of um, Russian colonialism and imperialism, a topic that outside of the regions affected, essentially, is very much downplayed at best, if not completely ignored and pretend, or some in some cases uh, defended and and all people say it doesn't exist, essentially, or has never existed. Uh, all, due to our f- regions that we focus on and the ones we are familiar with, uh, We'll mostly focus, uh, when it comes to that kind of discourse, on the differences between, for example, in Europe versus the U.S. And even in Europe, there's like a Western Europe and Eastern Europe difference, obviously. And I will try my best to include also, I think, the common discourses that I've seen um, coming from the Arab world as well, uh, which have been at times equally problematic, to be honest. But what are some reflections that you want to share of uh, the past, I don't know, past few weeks or past couple of months or however far back you want to go, to be honest. So I guess if it's okay, if I will start. Yep. So um, for me, the the biggest shift happened exactly three weeks ago because it was the first time uh, since war started when I came to Kiev. Um, And it it kind of changed my my whole perception of what is happening there and whole, whole perception actually of Ukrainian society also. So right now I'm still in this um, very strange phase where I cannot describe fully what do I feel, but for sure this is something that changed my um, my mind um, because before that I can I can relate only to 24th of February that it was kind of the same amount of shock that I received. So it's it's interesting to be right now and actually it's interesting that because I want to go back again as soon as possible, which is. I didn't expect that. Nagomia, you've been, as far as I remember, you've been there since it started, uh, since February. So, but I mean, re- recently things got worse, at least as far as like your personal connections are concerned. I don't know. You can speak to as much as you want about that. Obviously, <coughs> feel free to share what you want to share. Yeah, but I mean, what, what can you say? Yeah, it's been, it, it's been absolutely. A challenge like I don't think there's a rule book for how you're supposed to feel or act during a war. Um, 
and especially uh, a couple of weeks back, there was the strike in Vienna, which is my hometown, which is where I typically live I'm in Kiev at the moment. Um, but usually I spend my summers in Vienna anyway, uh, though since the beginning of the war, I've been living in Vienna this whole time. And especially if you're not on the front lines, and there, it's easy to feel disconnected from what's happening. Um, I think most of the country felt this way uh, during the past eight years of war, where Donbass just seemed far away. And if you didn't know people were fighting, you didn't know volunteers there, you didn't know people um, living on the front, then it was easy to pretend that this is something um, far away that, that you could effectively ignore it. And of course, um, people in Donbass and, and the soldiers uh, and the defenders fighting there this whole time complained about this. Um, though, I don't know whether this it's probably for the worse, but there is no kind of illusion like that now. Um, after the Russians kind of left Kiev Oblast and they left and they stopped bombing like major highways like the, the um, Jostomer Highway and stuff. Uh, and the store started to open up again. People started to go out in the streets and, um, I won't say it was the same that this war is far away, but it, there was almost a sense that you could sort of relax. Um, after the strike convenience, uh, like that's gone again, um, air raid sirens that I kind of learned to ignore. I now pay attention to, um, I don't run into shelters yet again. Um, but that was definitely something that I was like debating starting up again. And every time one goes off, it's no longer just this kind of background noise that you can filter out. Um, there's a very clear sense that whoever is on the receiving end of that siren, um, or the missiles intended target will, will likely not, not breathe again. Uh, and it really brings that into incredible, incredible sharp relief that you know that every time that siren goes off, people die. And it could be anyone. It could be, we're not just talking about soldiers or people on the front. It could literally be anyone in the country doing anything at any time of day, just completely unprovoked, random death falling out of the sky. Uh, and that is something, to be honest, I'm still struggling with with um, processing and, and struggling to really comprehend on a, on a base level because we live in the 21st century. It's a, it's a relatively safe century. Um, as world history goes. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's something that really does occupy quite a bit of my thoughts. The first thing that sort of comes to mind, and I'm not gonna make this into a Lebanon thing because I do that sometimes and it's annoying, but just to, as a point of, of reflection, uh, speaking from like my own experience, um, I've personally never been in a situation where I felt that a bomb can fall over me at any time. And that's because in the only war that happened in my lifetime, because um, I was born in 91, was the 2006 war, which was between Israel and Hezbollah. And it was sort of understood and this is something that, I, I mean, I was 15 back. I didn't quite understand anything. But I, I was told this by older folks and folks around me and whatever, that our area was safe because the Israelis were not targeting our area. And indeed, it, it was the case. Our area was safe. It lasted for a month, uh, and we were okay. And it was only later on, uh, literally f four years later, when I started university in Beirut, that I started meeting folks from other parts of Lebanon whose experience of that summer were, was obviously extremely different. Um, and that's, that's, what, that's my earliest memory of an understanding that war was here and war could have been above me because I knew war was around me and I could even, because of the mount, how the mountains work in Lebanon and I come from the mountains, I could literally see the Israeli jets bombing Beirut. I could literally see them. Um, but it, there was a, I was 15, I was being protected by, by my parents who were telling me, don't worry, you know, you will be okay, that sort of thing. Um, I was, yeah, I felt that, okay, well, personally, we're okay, essentially. And so there was a distance, an emotional distance between what was happening, essentially, to other parts of Lebanon and what was where, how my life was on a daily basis 
as it happens, I mean, I don't want to, I don't usually want to spend too much time focusing on like online discourses and Twitter discourses and that sort of thing. And because it, it's just like 80% of the time is toxic. But there are certain things that I feel are common uh, misconceptions at best, if I want to be generous about this. And at worst, obviously, uh, ill-meaning people who are just toxic and are being assholes online. Um, but the misconceptions I want to focus on, because the assholes are not going to listen to this and it doesn't matter what they think. But the misconceptions are that there is a certain idea of what war is like. And there's a certain idea of if anyone is doing anything that doesn't feel like it's come out of a Hollywood movie. Therefore, there's something, uh, uh, they're lying, or there's something fake about their experience, or there's something that's just not, at the very least, there's something that basically, well, it's not worth paying attention to anymore. Like This isn't really a war anymore, or this isn't whatever, because there's this one idea of what, quote-unquote, a war like, looks like. And so I wonder if you can kind of use that as a, as a start of a conversation on that, and maybe Romeo, since you've been there from the beginning, and Mariam, since you've returned recently, uh, again, feel free to share as much as you want. The details are up to you, of course. Um, what can you, this, how can you even describe the, the daily? How does that, uh, how do you, you wake up in the morning and uh, what, what goes through your mind as much as you can, basically? And I don't know who wants to come. Go for it. Go for it. Mariam, okay. so. Yeah. So, um, basically, from the beginning of war, uh, of course, like my anxiety was on a very high level, and I needed way to compromise this anxiety and be able to do something. So I have a I had a deal with myself that, as far as my brother is safe, I'm I don't care. Like literally, I don't care. I just I just ignore. Of course, I'm thinking about war. Of course, I'm talking, but I I'm I'm trying to not be attached uh, to that feeling. Um, my brother's. Um, he was lo uh, located to the war zone in April, and this is moment when I start to to be anxious all, all the time. I, I, it was interesting because at some point I start to have dreams about my dead brother's uh, body, and I didn't figure out why it's happening. And um, apparently, I start to work also with a therapist, and she said that. Uh, my brain is start trying to adjust the idea with the idea that my brother could die because it's something that I didn't expect. You know, typically we kind of uh, prepare for the idea of our parents dying because it's normal. This is how it should be, but not siblings. It was interesting how my brain, uh, how my conscious tried to try to do this homework just to prepare myself. So um, from April, it was a bit of nightmare and I, I I don't really remember anything um, happening like emotionally and uh, when my brother was wounded he was wounded in the beginning of June it was two anti-tank mines that um, reacted and um, my brother's car with the three people were just blow with the car um, one person will kind of died um, in, in the same second um, second person, um, he's in a coma right now. And my brother, he he doesn't have an, his right eye anymore. And there was part of the brain, apparently, that also was were injured. Um, so after that, I was like, okay, now I'm done. <laughs> the worst thing happened. It, okay, it's not the worst thing, because this is another annoying part for me that a lot of people are saying, at least he's alive. I This is something that, Please, people don't say, like, never say that. This is just horrible. Um, so, of course, he's alive. It's, it's understandable, but um, there is a lot of challenges also. So, after that, I, I was able to focus on how actually people live there, how actually my friends are there. So, um, I decided to come to Kiev just to see my brother, um, which was also emotionally very challenging because I was, I, I, I trying to be honest with you, I was very scared. I didn't know how I will react with to his body. I was very scared that he will see that I'm scared looking at him. Um, yeah, I guess it was one of the, the most embarrassing couple of seconds in my life when I saw that he's seeing that I'm scared to look at him. Um, so I was focused only on that. You know, I was focused on my brother and everything else that's happening, it was kind of on the background. But of course, it, something was happening. 
So uh, I was living in the center of Kiev, and I and before that, I was sure that there is a there is a um, huge gap of universe um, between people who ever heard siren and never listened to that. Like I think there is a big difference, and because this is something that Western societies think that this is normal, but I think this is privilege to feel like you are living in a pe- peaceful place. And to feel safe, and when um, and we kind of born with this idea that this is how it should be. We should have food, we should have water, and we should feel safe. So when this very stable platform got removed from your under your feet, I guess this is like something that changed your your life completely. So I was very curious how would they react to to the first siren, and and we were living very like very close to, to siren, like it was. The, the source of the of the sound was very close to you know, close to us, and it was very funny because my friends knew that I will be a little bit nervous, so they just come to my to my room with dog and just sit there and look at me with the dog. And it was very very funny. And they they said that if I want to go to bathroom, we can go to bathroom. So we didn't go to shelter. Um, the noise is it's not pretty. It's not it's not nice. But uh, two days after that, uh, as Romeo, I was just I adjust to the sound. But what was interesting, and this is completely different when you live abroad and when you're in Ukraine, when you're living abroad and you hear about that, okay, there is sirens, there is something falling, like Russia is a, is a terrorist state, this is obvious. But when you're there, I remember it was 4 a.m. Four, I, I just remember it was morning. I was very sleepy. And there was a siren. And my brain was like, I was thinking, oh my God, please not here, please not here, just not here. I went to sleep and I woke up and I heard about Vinitsa. And I was like, and I felt so much guilt that I asked not here. Yes, it wasn't here. And I realized this idea that you were saying that each time you have, you, you, you're hearing siren, someone can die or maybe dying. And this is something that I didn't understand why I wasn't in Ukraine, that there is, um, there is aftermath after every sound. And this is something that just struck me. Um, also that, you know, it's very annoying to, it was very annoying for me to live in society who, which I think cannot feel the same amount of empathy that I need. Like people cannot understand me. So I feel, I felt very lonely in, in Europe, super lonely. But there is an, another thing. You feel very lonely, but your friends are living their lives. So in case they want to, you want to hang out or something, you can kind of switch off Ukrainian reality and you can relax a bit. But in Ukraine, you don't feel lonely. Your people are super united. This is, this is such a nice thing to feel after a after couple of months in, in, in Europe. But there is another thing. You, you start to have any small talk with any person and you start to feel like, you know, the, the amount of tragedy for Ukrainian society, for me, it's like a wave. And you just know, okay, this is just a wave. But in, in Kyiv, I, I, I was able to zoom in zoom, and to see each drop of that tragedy. Like you talk with the, with the person on the street and the amount of grief that this person is like right now feeling, it, it just, it, it, you cannot even understand that. And of course, you're sharing your story and you see the same reaction from another person. And I've tried to talk with a person who's working in the, I don't know, who's cutting your hair and she's from Mariupol and you were like, you don't know how does she work. After you talk, like my friend, he, he right now he has a cat and I'm like, oh, such a nice cat. He's like, yeah, my friend died in Bucha. This is his cat. Like this amount of everyday tragedy, it's just enormous. And I didn't expect that to see. So this is like something that, change for me the um, whole experience and also on the railway station when I was coming back it was super like typically you know railway station is pretty loud place but it was super chill uh, and nobody even talked but there was like maybe 100 people on the platform and at some point I was like why it's so quiet here and I realized that people are not people are just hugging each other men and women and they're not talking and again this is like another wave of silent tragedy 
that you see and you see that this amount of kids and, and mothers in the in the um, in the train and like line of men looking at them just looking like not crying just looking so i guess for me this is something that shifted my um my perception a lot that i felt very i can feel very lonely in europe but in the same time i have this privilege to be distracted uh from 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 this from war in ukraine you feel very united and also to be honest this is part of um cultural propaganda which is completely normal like we have big boards who are saying that world is with us this is something that i didn't felt in in europe uh, like that world is with with us i didn't feel that uh but in the same time you just live with this yeah, with this tragedy every day, and this is something that's crushing you down. And I, Romeo, I don't, I don't know how you actually. I think you need a lot of strength inside. Maybe you don't even realize that, but I just want to say that. Uh, I guess this is just undescribable. Um, the amount of information and emotion that you you must feel every day. My, <clears throat> actually, have a kind of an amusing anecdote on that. Um, I went to the endocrinologist recently, and she's like looking over my vitals. She asked me, oh, what do you do for a living? I'm like, well, I'm a journalist. And immediately, without like pausing or a break in her like routine, she writes down, okay, here's a prescription for anti-anxiety medication. <laughs> I think she 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 kind of understood. <laughs> um it absolutely is um, quite stress, quite stressful, but at the same time, like you still have to live. Um, like time doesn't stop during war, as it turns out. You know, um, growing up, you'd read like the stories about World War Two, and it just seemed like for for those brief five six years, just the world was just about the war and nothing happened except for the war. But in reality, it turns out things aren't like that. People get married. They, they have kids, they move, they, you know, got, get fired. They find new jobs. Like they meet like normal human existence keeps on rolling. And that feels really surreal at times. Um, like I, I had to, I had my birthday um, like five days ago. And the whole time I was just thinking, like, what what am I celebrating? <laughs> like, another year? Like, uh, like my country's at war. What am I celebrating? But at the same time, you know, you go to a restaurant and you go out with friends. And obviously me being a journalist, we still just talk about the war. <laughs> so life, life just keeps going. Um, but actually, Miriam, I, I did want to ask. So since I've been like in Ukraine, I, I haven't left the country in quite a while now. Um, what is the public mood like in Europe? Because like, obviously I, I see like texts from like friends in like Poland and Latvia, Lithuania. And they're like, Oh, we love Ukraine. We're supporting you. But like, I don't really have a good sense of what Western Europe is like. What do Italians think? Like the Brits seem like they, they, they follow what's going on, but what do the French think? Like, what do Germans think? I'm I'm really curious to know, like, what, the, like, I guess the average Western European thinks about the conflict at all. Okay, so uh, sorry from for what you will hear, uh, because my perception could be not very um, good. I mean, there is, of course, I cannot. I will generalize right now. This is. I cannot do anything else because I didn't do any studies. I would like to do some studies about that, but yeah, anyways, right now I couldn't. So um, there is a lot of interesting things. So for example, first time for the day, day of war, I talked with one of my coworkers. He's actually a pretty nice person. He's from Germany. He was asking me if this is first day. And uh, because my, my, my brother, sorry, was already at, at war five years ago. So for me, it was obvious that he will be drafted again. Um, so, my coworker asked me, when you will surrender? How many days? It was first day. I tried to explain, like, I remember I, I didn't know what to answer. So I said that, you know, like surrendering for us, it's not an option. So for us, death as a subject is the same as a, just death. So as, as a society, so like, it's not an option. And I realized, okay, they, they didn't get it. 
next time I talk about something, I talk about Mariupol and how they were bombing uh, theater with the with the cyan children on the asphalt. Uh, my coworker said that, uh, yeah, you know, but like, um, they will never start another war, like a bigger war. I said that, why not? They they start war with Ukraine. Uh, my coworker said something like, yeah, but we have an agreement. And I said, we also had an agreement. And she said, well, in this well, you have all the specter of imperialism that you actually feel from Europe also. Like, yeah, but it's different, you know? Like, agreement with Ukraine is not the same as agreement with... And you, like, it's it's very subtle. Like, you cannot... Nobody's saying anything bad to you. Everyone is supporting. But, you know, like, for example, you try to explain how your life changed. Like, you have whole house of refugees you didn't have in your, your place anymore. And they were like, yeah, but, like, you still, like, no, no, you don't know what do I feel. Like, you, your life is the same. And... Um, at some point, some of my, some of my friends said, told me that they have too much of war in Ukraine. And it was my friends. And I was like, yeah, it's too much for me as well. So I stopped talking to my friends about war because, again, I didn't know with who, like, what should I do. Um, and again, I cannot say that, you know, somebody's bad time is good because I guess it's also very... Um, okay, I don't want to to play therapist right now here. But anyways, this is this was also very um, hard for me. But at some point, it was interesting also that uh, some of my friends told me that they were sure for whole life, they were, this is what they were taught in school, that war is the most horrible thing in the world and you need to stop it as fast as possible. They were saying that every time I'm looking at how Ukrainians are fighting, I'm thinking maybe it was wrong, but that we're, maybe there is something more important than war. But two words to stop the war. So um, there was also a lot of stereotypes that is coming right now about Ukrainian refugees, which is interesting because most of Ukrainians look very European-like. So there is no like segregation by by, by the appearance. But there was a moment, for example, when my my friend um, there was she's living she's living in a in a private house. Um, so there was a salesperson who wanted to say the alarm system. So the person was saying, it's like, oh, you need to alarm, to have the alarm system right now, for sure. My friend asked why, she said, because there was Ukrainians. You know, you start to hear all of this thing. And this is very, like, of course, with each week, you know that this topic is less and less relevant. At some point, my friends start to ask, not friend, but co-workers start to ask me, oh, it is better in Ukraine, yes? I said, if you have it less on your news, it doesn't mean it's better. Um, so... Yeah, you, you, okay, but this is for me. This is my perception. I have the same from perception. Some, <laughs> from some communication with some people, I realized one thing. They're super scared and they're much more scared than us because we were fighting and our generation, our previous generation, generation before that, they were fighting. This is another discussion of trauma of generations, but let's, let's put it aside. That generation, they didn't fight and generation before, I'm talking about Western societies. So I remember how my friend, who is Italian, he asked me, but you don't, you don't think that, um, no, he said, oh, something like, you don't expect us to fight for you. And I said, no, we just need your weapon. And he was so, so relieved. And I realized that you can actually almost physically touch this fear, this fear of having war, and you know for sure that behind all of these ethics world uh, words about how we should stop the war, about pacifism and so on, you know that behind of that there is a big fear to be in our shoes right now. So this is something for me very frustrating also, because I guess it's completely fine to admit that we are scared, we don't want to have war in our country, we are super scared, rather than say, oh, you're too emotional, you know, Ukraine's a different deal, Russia will never do that to us, all of that. Yeah, I don't know, did I explain you well or not? Yeah, and I mean, I can only add to that by saying that I think from the beginning, um, I've been on this signal group that I sometimes mention that Romeo is now a part of, um, that from the beginning we sort of were worried and the only the reason i'm mentioning that group is that it's it happens to have like syrians and bosnians and 
um, other groups of people that have some form of experience with at least what we're talking about or some some type of similarity or familiarity but that the fear was a the factor of time that at the end of the day there is a uh, a mixture of um, fear as you said Maryam there's also a lot of cynicism in Western Europe uh, a lot of appeasement a lot of just wishing it away which at this point I think it's half of the EU's policy to just wish things away on most topics around the world uh, but especially uh, and specifically on that as well and to just not want to deal with something until you absolutely have to and even when you absolutely have to a lot of the time it's in reaction to what is happening rather than taking some kind of action. It's usually in response to something rather than acting in advance. As if there there is the sense that you don't want to rock the boat too much, as if if you're if you're uh, saying certain words or supplying certain weapons or doing certain actions or whatever it is, as if you're you're waking up the, the beast, you know, as if you're waking up something that you don't want to wake up essentially. And the irony, obviously, is that, and this is something that we, we have talked about on this podcast before, but obviously there was a lot of conversation in the beginning of, uh, like basically towards the end of February, early March, when the first waves of, of Ukrainian refugees were coming to the rest of, of, of Europe. Uh, a lot of discourse about how, you know, non-white refugees were being discriminated against, and white in quotation, um, et cetera, et cetera, which is, of course, true. And, you know, that, that, was, that was and is still a problem in Europe in general. But what was often missed is that, it's not that far off that at some point this will extend towards Ukrainians as well because of the anti or like, you know, the stereotypes and the cliches and the racism and the xenophobia towards anyone from Eastern Europe. I mean, it's not that long ago. It feels like ancient history now, but it's not that long ago that everything Brexit related discourse, uh, half of the time was about like, you know, Africans and brown people and Muslims and whatever. But the other half of the time was about Romanians and Poles and, you know, and, and that sort of, of discourse. It was really a lot about that. Now it's, it's not in the front, it's not in the news as much anymore. You, you would see it if you go on the website and, you know, you search for it, you will find it. But I pay attention to the, what is front page news here in Geneva, for example. And it's, I haven't seen a front page news on Ukraine in quite some time now, even after like big revelations. I think Bucha was on it. I think that was one of the examples, but. You know, at some point it's like, well, we've covered two or three massacres. We're not going to cover a fifth one or whatever. There is there is that sense. It's very uh, cynical. It's also a learned. There's a there's a form of fatigue among some people, obviously as well. But that fatigue can be turned also into cynicism. There's one, as as Mariam said, there's one way. There's I mean, there's on the one hand saying, yeah, this this seems really horrible and tiring, and I I don't even know how to think about it. Like I don't even know how to what to do and I feel helpless and whatnot. That's one way of approaching it. And it's fair enough. If you don't know what to do, you don't know what to do. Uh, there's only so many times you can just tweet, you know, at some point you feel like this isn't making much of a difference. Um, but then there's the other side, which is, I think, the most cynical side, which I think ends up kind of creeping up to the surface when it comes to European politics, especially Western European politics. So yeah, that, that would be my addition to that. That's something that I'm um, I'm really scared of is this cynicism turning into just outright apathy like in italy um during the past eight years of war um especially their their media loved drawing equivalencies between um ukraine and russia look like maybe the russians are wrong to 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 like um take part of ukraine but you know the ukrainians are repressing russians and like they're forcing everyone to speak ukrainian and other like bullshit russian propaganda narratives um, and, and I'm really terrified if that again becomes like the common feeling is people pay less attention to the conflict as they get more and more tired of like Ukrainians on social media complaining about the war for them to, cause it's easy, right? To just go, well, you know, it's complicated. Russia's obviously done some horrible stuff, but I'm sure Ukraine's also done horrible stuff. So who's, who, who can really say who the bad guy is? It's always the, but it's always the, I don't like Putin, but it's, you know, Russia is not good, but, and that, that's where everything follows after that. Yeah. That, that fear, like that equivalency really scares me because I feel at that point, Ukraine will lose will seriously start losing international support. And we kind of rely on it. We need people um, to keep pressuring their governments to continue to support us financially and militarily. 
Um, without that, we will lose. And if the the average kind of voters' um, opinion is just going to be, well, you know, it's this this complicated, like, who can tell conflict and the Russians have done bad stuff and the Russians say the Ukrainians are doing doing horrible stuff, like, maybe it's not our business. We, we helped out in the beginning. Now it's the Ukrainians' turn to, to solve this for themselves. Um, when in, in reality, like, that's just an abdication of responsibility. Um, it, 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 one of the things that kind of shocked me, Miriam, about, um, when you, when you were telling me like your European colleagues reactions is like, do they not real, like the thought that kept going through my head is like, do they not realize how they are responsible for this? Like, is that not like you, you literally funded this regime, you legitimized it. Um, you continue to push the narrative that Russia is a normal country, that once the trade links are established and everything, they, they, they'll they come here for holiday and um, they'll immigrate and everything will be like completely fine. Um, and, and there's no need to read. Do they not like that? That was that was something that, that was shocking to me, to be honest. I guess we should wait for for Joey to come back. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I have here something to say because, oh, my God. Yeah. Um, you know, I was every time I'm talking about this topic, I am referring to one dude in ancient Greek Greek time when um, Protagor who's saying that person human is a measure of everything, and I guess this is when we start this problem of uh, human centrism and European centrism, of course, the idea that we are, we are super. Um, um, we are individuals and we can live separate from the society. So I don't need you. You don't need me. My whole world, my whole personality is just such a huge universe that if I will die, the, the universe dies. So this idea of like the hyper individual centrism is very common and very typical in, in Western societies, which, which I think linked to second uh, topic, the idea of my country doesn't have anything with your country. Because my country is living in a vacuum economically, culturally, so there is no connection. And if I live here good and you live here there bad, it means this is your fault, not mine. And what I can say is I, I can, I can uh, pity you, I can give you some, I don't know, um, some help, but only if after that I feel like I'm a good person. <laughs> If I'm by helping you, you doesn't look like a refugee. You don't look brown. You don't look very poor. I don't want to help you because helping you is not is not helping me to feel better person. So when I'm trying to explain to them that there is for French per person there is actually very distinguishable link to the idea that French government were selling weapon to Russia specifically when we had war. They are denying that, or they are not like I think this is the whole problem of again western society the idea that we live here good because we are good because we are know how to live and you are weirdos and when i try to say no 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 no, there is a reason why you live good and it's connected to the idea that other countries live bad so we need to understand that this is whole um, responsibility is like responsibility for something that's happening in in africa right now uh like this is ukrainian responsibility as well that's why i think it's important for us to talk about this as well or, for example, something that's happening in Afghanistan, it's also my responsibility. But again, this is burden that European people are not, they are not willing to live with. Because the idea, again, this is my perception, the idea of European uh, values right now is about everyday comfort. Please give me my cup of tea, give me my very nice couch, and don't, don't bother me. Like, just don't bother me. Um, yeah, and no, they don't have this idea of um, their responsibility at all. While you two were talking, I went to get this, uh, well, people listening won't know what I'm talking about, but I'll describe it. Like, it's a pack of cards, and you can see people here. And it's basically with, of course, Vladimir at the front, uh, front of it, our friend Putin. Uh, but it's a, it's a pack of cards that was prepared by a group called Public Eye, which is a Swiss uh, NGO, uh, anti-corruption, that sort of thing. And the pack of cards is called Oligarch en Suisse, the oligarchs in Switzerland. And... I, I swear to God, there's about, I think, I don't know, 40 of them or something like this. And something like half of them are Russians. And they're all here, uh, either physically here or were here before, whatever. Now they're on some yacht somewhere. Or they, they, um, their bank account is here. And in fact, their bank account is still here. Like to this day, while, I'm, while we're recording this, 
recording this end end of July for those listening. Um, the I for, and I have the I don't have the statistics with me, but it was something along the lines of the Swiss government had announced uh, a certain percentage of like uh, or let like, let's say how much money they had confiscated or at least um, seized or whatever they were frozen the the bank accounts were frozen. But then the Association of Swiss Bankers, or again, whatever the actual name is, came out and said that this is actually roughly 3% of the number of uh, Russian oligarchy money here in Switzerland. So we are talking about like hundreds of billions. This is, this is the num- number of, this is the amount that we're talking about. This is, this is the difference between being able to fund, you know, a Himar or, or whatever. You know, these are, these are the, this is, this, this is the kind of money that now I saw like a group of, Polls were like fundraising online to uh, get one. You know, like this is the this is the this is the amount of money we're talking about. But it it touches very deeply. I will speak only on when it comes to Switzerland. It touches very deeply to something that's very taboo in Switzerland, which is that most people know that shit happens in Swiss banks. This is not rocket science. You know, you everyone knows this, but it's like don't talk about it too much. You know, from time to time, maybe pass a law here and there. But don't think too much about the fact that all of these companies, whether we're talking about the oil barons and, or, you know, the, the, what's the Azerbaijani dude, Aliyev, or, you know, whatever, all of those guys that have accounts here and there, you can, you can, you can type the, the name of the companies associated with them. You can see where the address is because it's just an office somewhere and like about 20 minutes from where I live. You know, it's just that. And it's just considered as a business among other businesses. And most people don't want to think too much about that. Because I think, and this is me being a therapist, which I shouldn't be, but I think there is a, a sense that part of the welfare state that we have, a percentage of that, a part of the reason why we have this amount of money that provides, although Switzerland doesn't really have a welfare state, but you see what I mean, that these comforts, these, these, these uh, social services and whatnot, part of it comes from very dodgy sources and we don't want to look into it too much. From time to time, it makes it, you know, when there's something particularly egregious or something that's not very media friendly or what have you sometimes it it pops up in the discourse but there's a difference between you finding out that you know vladimir putin has one bank account in which case maybe many people will say no no we need to shut this down this is unacceptable but there's a difference between that and then saying well actually there's like 50 of them that have bank accounts <laughs> you know, it's, it's not just one person there's like quite a lot of bank accounts around here you know and probably they have multiple ones uh, for that uh, here as well same for the UK, for that matter. You mentioned Romeo, like, yeah, for the most part, definitely no, there isn't, there aren't quite a lot of pro Russian sentiments in that sense. But this is also the country that had like poisonings on UK territory like four years ago, five years ago, the Skripal poisonings. And there's been a lot of that going on, basically. So I think like the Russians have burned some bridges when it comes to UK public sympathy. But that doesn't stop London from being a haven for Russian billionaires and Russian oligarchs, which it very much still is. I mean, it didn't stop Lebedev from gaining a lordship. Yes, 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 yes. exactly that, exactly that. So, you know, it's it's one of the things that that really bothers me about um, Western support, because it really does feel, especially after the the Vogue cover came out with Elena Zelensky, the first lady, um, and, and there's, like, I got this so, such a strong sense that, if Ukrainians aren't grateful to Europe, we don't deserve their help, which again, it boggles the mind because a Europe is responsible in, in very significant ways for this war. Of course, they didn't make the decision to invade, um, but they, to, to a very large extent funded it. They allowed Putin to consolidate his kleptocratic regime. They allowed Putin to hunt dissidents across all of Europe. The Interpol red notice system is still being used to literally kidnap people in supposedly safe Western Europe and drag them off to God knows where in Russia, where they then disappear. Um, they, they like the, like Europe enabled all of this to happen. Um, and then they turn around and say, oh, well, um, look, your like first lady is on the cover of a fashion magazine. How dare you? And it's like, what, what are you talking about? Like, no one asked your opinion. But I think, so let me, I, the Vogue thing has been uh, on the news recently. So let's just mention something about this. Other than like most of what's, every, the discourse around it has been so mind-bogglingly idiotic, but this is how things are these days. 
But I think it shows two things. One, um, Vogue has had actually a what should be an outrageous profile done of a first lady. And it wasn't this time around. It was 11 years ago because they did a profile of Asma al-Assad, uh, Bashar al-Assad's wife. And the reason why this was possible, and it came out in March 2011 when the massacre started, like that same month. But the reason it was possible is that there was a U.S. firm, I forgot the name of it, that was being paid $5,000 a month by the Assad regime, which is basically stolen Syrian money, to find some connections and to make this, uh, this Vogue thing uh, possible. Vogue since deleted the thing on the internet, but you can still find it with archives and obviously reports on it and so on and so forth, because they called Asma al-Assad uh, the rose of the desert, a rose in the desert or something stupid like that. So this would have been something to be outraged by, but the, the same kind of people that are supposedly outraged by what's happening by the Vogue cover of like a few days ago don't have anything to say about that because it's not about the cover. It's not about Vogue. It's not about shallowness in the midst of... It's really not about that. For me, I think the biggest uh, offense that uh, Zelensky caused in Western Europe is that for the most part, he wasn't asking, he was demanding. He wasn't uh, begging. He wasn't, you know, for the most part, he wasn't quite saying. He was saying, like, actually, this is on you as well. Uh, with all the critiques towards Zelensky, at this point, when these things happen right now, I don't, I don't really care. It's just not as important. But it's, it's really that. And you can feel it. I could feel it in the room. And I wasn't there with them. But I could feel it when he's talking that some of them were very uncomfortable. Like, who are you to talk to us like this? You know, you from Ukraine, whatever. Like, who are you to talk to us like this? And it's not, and I say it's a secret, it's not a secret. Many of these have come out very publicly. It's now, it's now part of like acceptable discourse. In the first few weeks, let's say first month or so after the invasion, even Orban couldn't be too pro-Putin. Like he had to kind of tone it down a tiny bit. Like he had to kind of fuck off for a few, for a few weeks. But at some point, like these people gain confidence again. And the more this dragged on, the more the, the more the war, the closest thing that Europeans started to feel, or the first thing that they were familiar with, or the first thing that they were associating with, wasn't even refugees, because they can extend, you know, say sure, whatever, why not, etc. But it was gas prices, and it was wheat, and it was that. As, so, as soon as this became that, and this started dominating conversations and discourses surrounding Ukraine, this is when you started feeling that people started to kind of take a step back like oh maybe this is maybe we got involved in something we don't want to get involved in maybe you know that's because for multiple reasons one they don't quite understand that they were always involved in in one way or another but it's just that there is no part of the discourse is that it makes you makes you believe otherwise that you know you can just turn off the news and that's it but you mentioned italy before Romeo, and i you know i have uh, italian relatives through through my my, my my wife and one relative in the early days i think it was in april or something like that I remember very clearly she asked me, like, this Zelensky guy, is he um, a, is he like a fool or a hero in your, in your view? <laughs> and I was like, in my mind, I was like, oh, those are the only two options. But OK, in that case, <laughs> in that case, well, a hero, in, obviously. And so but there is that. And so she didn't disagree with me. But more that the, re- the reaction was like, hmm, yeah, OK. And that's it. And then, you know, we then we because it was on the news, something was happening on the news. But then after that, well, something else is on the news. You know, like this is, this is the thing is that at what point or to what extent are people made to believe that this is something that they're personally involved in? And if they feel personally involved in, then maybe, okay, they can act in a certain way. But if they're so told time and time again that like, don't worry, we'll take care of this or it will die down or, you know, he can't be that crazy, you know, Putin, he, does, he, he, he will, we get, we give him something, you know, appeasement basically. And yeah, it's. I don't like to make pre World War II parallels, obviously, because no situation is ever the same. But discourses tend to rhyme. Discourses tend to echo. These things, even before World War II, the most, the closest thing I can think of is during the Spanish Civil War, where discourses around Franco and then obviously Mussolini, Hitler was like, it's just a Spanish problem. You know, as long as they don't come to France or they don't come to the UK or British Empire at the time or whatever, we won't we won't have to deal with it and indeed they had to deal with it not that far after not that long after obviously but yeah yeah i'm i'm just realized that i was censoring myself for a couple of last four i guess months so i'm not saying about this publicly i'm not saying that guys this is your fault but i'm right now i'm thinking maybe i should because um this is something that of course western journalists won't say because like nobody wants to talk about that. Because like nobody will, nobody wants to read that. I guess it's very similar. Uh, I wrote about that. I guess for me it's very similar with 
um, with cooperation that we need for climate change, or for example, cooperation that we need to beat all the gender stereotypes. Like it's not just I'm giving you my dollar and I feel like I'm a good person. I am a good person and I know that because I read these books in school. I know something about ethics and I see myself as a hero because I give you one dollar. But this is something different. I need to feel a bit of discomfort for myself, for you. And when we talk about discomfort, not just giving something that you actually don't don't very need, because when we're asking for money, we're asking for something that you might leave with this with without this one box per, per day. But when we're asking to feel some discomfort, oh no. Here um, all the empathy stops because I don't want to feel cold. Like I just don't want to feel cold. I don't care about the war. I don't want I don't I don't care about the amount of people. I don't want to feel cold because this is discomfort. And I guess this is what I'm feeling right now, that this is the main value in Europe is the comfort, like this this feeling of the comfort. Please don't, don't take it away from me because if we will take away the comfort, what will we have? Like the, the, the heritage of good old days of em, em, empires. Uh, so I guess this is also something that, the same what we need with climate change. We need people to feel discomfort, like we need to change our like perception of water to save others and it's not okay and it's something very important it's not because i'm a good person it's because i will i will be dead <laughs> so i guess it's also we need to shift this idea that we're helping ukraine because we're good we know that there is good and bad thing like you know it's like star wars right now perception there is good force and bad force and we're no 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 it's because if not today tomorrow in 10 in 10 years in 20 years russia will expand because this is the idea of empire the difference is when it will happen, we won't exist anymore as a Ukraine. So right now we're just trying to say that we like everyone here, all of your values, all of your comfort will be vanished. Just help us now. And this is very interesting because again, for me, the same as climate change, because like, it's not about we need to have more food or like when you need to travel less. No, no, no. It's because your kids won't be able to, to travel or go anywhere. So yeah. That's why I think it's a very uncomfortable situation to discuss. And that's why, and to be honest, a lot of Ukrainians, me as well, I'm scared to talk about that because I feel like I'm not grateful. And this is some feeling of guilt that you receive as a, as a post-colony, that you feel need to feel grateful to that, to that civilized countries. Mm. So I'm also not saying that. And I think, so this is something that I've noticed when it comes to Syria, more than towards Lebanon. But... A lot of the times, it's almost like I'm put in a position, and actually with climate change, this happens even more regularly these days, but you're sort of put in a position where you're the one who's ruining the mood of the day, or the mood of the dinner, or the mood of the party, or the mood of the whatever. You know, most people want to talk about Netflix, or series, or the weather, which, fine, whatever, that's that's fine to talk about as well. I'm not saying we need to be intense 24-7. But there is this sense of like, if you if we start talking about this thing, it becomes real. And there is this term that I think I accidentally coined, you know, <laughs> mutually assured delusion, which is a bit of that. It's like if five people in the room, uh, if there's a wildfire nearby and there is, I don't know, five people in the room, we can talk about it because it's like nearby. But then when it's done, it's like, you know, it's been defeated or whatever. A week later, two weeks later, you, you, you're not, you don't want usually to be the person who still wants to talk about it. It's like, well, we've dealt with this. Let's, let's move on. And there is a sort of a group pressure on that case. And it's the same thing that happened with the pandemic. This, it's a very human phenomenon. So the cynicism is in some sense universal. The main difference when it comes to Western European, especially Western Europeans, is that there is a sense, again, that they want to be in denial of the direct uh, role. Because there's a difference between like the average Lebanese who is cynical about Ukraine and Russia. For the most part, what happens in Lebanon just doesn't matter. Like, it, like factually, it just does not matter. But, you know, for every dollar that a European, a Western European has given to a Ukrainian refugee or whatever, how much of that money has gone from their states to fund the Russian state via node, node pipeline one, one, whatever it's called? You know, it's, it's, the scale is just not the same. And again, it's the same thing of the, when the scale isn't the same and when it's sort of streamlined, there's something that happens psychologically. If, you, if there is literally an announcement today in Switzerland that says, or in France, let's say, that says we are going to send $5 billion to Vladimir Putin, and they announce it, 
many people would be like, what the fuck? Don't, no, don't do this. This is stupid and we need that money and obviously he's a piece of shit, whatever. But if it's streamlined, like if something that just happens every day, you know, and you don't have to think about it, then it's easier to do. And that's exactly what's been happening. If every single day they had to re-decide in Europe, hey, do we want to take, do we want to pay, I don't even know what the daily average is in terms of uh, for gas and oil money to, to Russia. Many people are like, well, we've been doing this and we've, we've said yes like 90 times since this started. Maybe we should say no now. But it's not a daily decision. It's a streamlined decision. It's one. It's like almost left left to the magic of the the, the the free hand of the market. You know, the magic hand of the market essentially. But this is where we're at, and because of that, I do think cynicism ends up becoming complicity. And if you start feeling complicit, if you if you yourself start feeling that, oh, maybe this thing that I'm doing, um, I'm, I might be causing harm, and you don't want to put, you don't want to connect A to B. Okay, like, and so you don't have to connect A to B if everyone around you also doesn't want to connect A to B. Then you're sort of sheltered by the fact that everyone else also doesn't want to do that. And with Syria, it's been that time and time again. Even more extreme, I would say, uh, relatively speaking, all of these things are relative. I don't like to compare these things, but relatively more extreme than the discourse towards Ukraine. Because at the very least, at the beginning, now it's dying out sl- slowly, hopefully no, not, but it seems to be the case. There was a sense of like, well, we're sort of involved in this in one way or another, we in Western Europe. But with Syria, that was from the very beginning. Like, this is just over there. We have nothing to do with it. You know, we're not, we're not connected to this, et cetera, et cetera. And it doesn't matter how many times you bring up the fact that actually the regime tortured people on behalf of George W. Bush. Actually, the regime was on good terms with, uh, I think it was Sarkozy or Chirac or whatever at the time. Chirac, I think. You know, it doesn't matter if you bring up these things. Well, that's in the past. Now we don't like him anymore. And whatever, you know, now it's just, it's actually Russia and you, and Iran's fault. I mean, it is, in, in that case, it is. But it doesn't mean that there's no connection. And it doesn't mean that your government, like the Danish have been doing, the Spanish were thinking of doing, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and many others. It doesn't mean that they wouldn't be willing to actually be complicit in one way or another uh, by deporting refugees, by, you know. It doesn't necessarily happen in the sense of the Denmark starts declaring we love Bashar al-Assad, but it, it, start, it does happen in the normalization of this course around deporting refugees. It happens in different ways, but it happens nonetheless. And now we're at the stage where the Assad regime is de facto recognized. Like that's it. Uh, as far as like the US will not say they recognize it, but de facto that already happened through many deals, accepting a pipeline here and there, you know, all of these things that has already happened. So what happens officially and what happens kind of de facto, those are nuances that I feel is lost uh, or is lost. Uh, in, in, in many of these you know, contexts that we're talking about. You know, this really reminds me of um, th- this. Uh, I, I heard this for um, some German um, journalists recently that they had this idea, right, that they could normalize Russia by trading with it, that like liberal jo- democratic values will pass along to Russia through trade. And as Russia gets richer and people get more comfortable, like democracy will naturally flower. But it really seems to me That literally the opposite happened. Russian values got transferred to Europe. This idea of, um, because Russians love saying like, what does it have to do with me? Like, I'm just some, some small guy. Like I I don't have any power. I don't have any money. What does anything have to do with me? I'm just trying to leave my, live my life and, and leave me alone and ignore the fact that like, I'm sending my kids off to murder you or I'm paying taxes to a government that's uh, helping a regime commit genocide, or just the fact that uh, we're stealing parts of our neighbor country. Like, just ignore of that. I have nothing to do with anything. Like, I'm not a Nazi. I'm not a fascist. I'm just trying to live my normal life while sharing um, memes that say Ukrainians are subhuman on social media. But I have nothing to do with anything. And that so- it sounds like this particular value has been passed along to Europe. Because, like, especially in the case of Germany, where they had to go through a society-wide reckoning after the defeat of the Third Reich, um, and it seemed to be mostly effective, no one is is accusing the Germans of all being secretly crypto-fascists or anything. Like, there are far-right movements in Germany, obviously, given their history. Um, but Germany itself is a pretty well-established liberal democracy. Um, But instead of using that kind of introspection of how were we, how are we responsible for the events going on today? It seems like they're acting like this typical Russian where it's like, 
mm, no, nothing to do with us. Like, yeah, we paid Putin for gas, but where else could we get the gas? Where else could we get the power? Like, we, I had no choice. I just had to participate in the system. Um, and it really is. So it, it sounds like Russian soft power has been much more effective in converting European values than the other way around. Let me add, add something. Um, Yassin Harsad, a Syrian intellectual, uh, has this, well, he said this a number of times, but he was describing how the world is becoming Syrianized because the world is in Syria. He said something along those lines. And there is a sense that, and may, this is something that feels like a truism, but it's one of those things that's very difficult to prove, right? Like you can feel it, you can see it, you can sort of make connections. But it's very difficult to like make make a very conclusive like A leads to B kind of reasoning. But it does seem that when you appease something that deep down or somehow you know is wrong, at some point you get impacted morally in one way or another. And this isn't rocket science, or this isn't like a discovery. This has been described many times. This is like, you know, I'm channeling James Baldwin who talked about white Americans. Um becoming moral monsters by accepting the institution of slavery, for example, for 200, 300 years, right? It's something you don't have to directly participate in it, but if you're benefiting from it in one way or another, it might just affect you in one way or another. The other thing is that I, I mentioned this before, and so this is already on the record, but I, by complete accident, met the Norwegian ambassador in, in Lebanon, uh, who was just, I was just somewhere with a friend and he was just there and he decided to talk to us because he felt chatty and there was no other context. We did, I didn't know who he was. I didn't even know he was the ambassador. I discovered this the next day. But he literally told us like quite, like, he doesn't like Putin again, but, but the, the but always follows after that. But it's like, well, we have a maritime border with them and we have trade and it's very important. And he said it like uh, matter of factly, basically, that we don't disrupt this because if we disrupt, if we don't disrupt this, then maybe we have leverage over him and maybe we can, you know, do this and do that and do this. And this, it doesn't matter that factually you can point to the fact that, well, this doesn't seem to have worked so far and doesn't seem to have worked in the eight years prior to what just happened. And by your own logic, if you had leverage, well, February shouldn't have happened in the first place if you had leverage, you know, but that doesn't matter because I think the, the desire to, continue business as usual and we see that we saw this in the early days of the pandemic we we see this with climate change today is such a strong feeling and it involves a, a wider stratum of society than just that those five asshole politicians that are corrupt like at some point this ends up being internalized in one way or another and i do think that you can talk to the average and here i'm generalizing but you can talk to the average western european and all day long about how bad Putin is. And most people will not disagree with you. Like he's not, he doesn't have a huge fan base in, in that sense. With the exception of like, you know, 1% of crypto fascists or like the odd anti-vaxxers who some, some, somehow feel like this has something to do with Ukraine or whatever it is. Um, besides those people, that's fine. But as long as you don't, and I'm repeating myself a bit, but as long as you don't bring the connection to me, like as long as, I don't have to personally feel or my community or my nation or whatever has to personally feel guilty about what's happening now. As long as we don't feel bad about what's happening, we can talk all day long. But as, if that's the rule of the game, you're, uh, you're absolving yourself from a lot of the, what's been actually happening. Because as a matter of fact, and this is just a fact that we can say with no hesitation, if, those money from, if that money from the first pipeline was stopped in one way or another. Yes, the average European will pay the price, right? gas hikes, gas price hikes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But Russia would actually be in trouble, and we know this. Like we just know we can put a you know one and one together. They need a certain amount of money. They can't just make it up from scratch. And this is, as of now, one of the most consistent source of income that they've had. So it's not that complicated to to put two and two together. But yeah, anyway. That's what I wanted to, to mention on that. Um, we didn't actually talk much <laughs> about, um, and if that's okay with you, let's get into it a bit, about sort of like the history and the context of Russian colonialism and Russian imperialism. Because, and I'm mentioning this from two different angles at the same time. One as someone who is in Western Europe and, and the other as someone from the Arab world, originally from Lebanon. 
in the Arab world, there is still, I'm not going to say a fan base towards Russia, because I think most people are just apathetic when it comes to, to or at least they feel like it's, it, it doesn't concern them. But when there are people who do actively think about it, a lot of people do think that Russia is on their side. And the anecdote that I've mentioned is a, my little cousin, who has nothing to do with the world, he's 11, but he f- saw somewhere on TikTok, because TikTok is a, it's a news source now, um, that Russia likes, loves Palestine and hates Israel. And he asked, he, asked my sister, <laughs> he asked my sister, who then shared with me the screenshot, whether he can put up a poster of the Soviet Union flag in his room. And so obviously this did not, is not going to happen. His mom wouldn't be happy with it or anything like this. But just to tell you that how these things get passed on in very uh, ways, that like almost if you don't pay attention, you won't realize that you have a, a Stalinist 11-year-old. <laughs> but, you know, this, these, are the, these are part of, this is part of how this ends up being circulated. You don't need facts. You need good stories. You need stories that are convincing or persua- persuasive, right? You need to be told that, well, Gaddafi was pan-African, or you need to be told that Bashar Assad resisted Israel. You need to be told these kinds of narratives. And as long as there is enough of a niche online, offline, what have you, of people who sort of have built their entire lives believing these certain stories, it's enough for other people to latch on to that. And facts in and of themselves don't change that. So that being said, and in Western Europe, it's whatever. We'll talk about it, I'm sure. But that being said, what, how can you explain Russian, or how do you? Because, Mariam, you've been doing this online for, for a few months now, like basically in the, in the role of an educator, if, if, that's the, if, that, if you allow me the term. But like, how, do you, how do you explain Russian colonialism and Russian imperialism to an audience that is not from the former Soviet Union or it doesn't have that? or Latvia, or whatever, that doesn't have that direct connection to either the USSR or the the Russian state before or after. Okay, so first of all, uh, sorry for everyone uh, who who knows the history, because I will say a lot of very, like, I will simplify it a lot. Uh, So right now I am uh, preparing, I was actually doing that for the last two months, I'm preparing lecture about um, image of Ukrainian uh, people, uh, no, just image of Ukrainian um, in Russian culture. I mean, in Russian culture for like last 300 years. So, and I was, and I'm reading a lot of bullshit, as you can imagine. So, and as a Ukrainian, I feel a lot of frustration all the time when I'm reading that, but it's also very interesting to see roots of that thing. So you will see what I'm going to. So at some point I was reading something like, oh yeah, this Russian Scotland I'm like, what? So yeah, there was naming Ukraine, Russian, Scotland. So I guess this is one of the easiest way to explain to to a person who never knew anything about that. If you ever watch movie uh, Braveheart, that's the easiest way. Like this is very simplified. Of course, there's a lot of content, but like if you want to to feel empathy, to amount of willingness to feel separate or freely. This is just scream freedom in the end. This, this is this is the same. Actually, of course, I will relate to this topic when I will uh, talk about the books uh, that I'm. I think it's it's a kind of good idea to read about Ukraine. So um, to be more serious, there is centuries of relationship between empire and colony, and it's. Of course, not only Ukraine, it needed to be explained that it's, of course, about all other countries that were much smaller in Russia, which is much easier because Russia is the biggest country. Um, and of course, it's not overseas colonization. This is one of the reasons why we don't talk about um, this kind of colonization, because there is no sea. And if there is no sea, there is no colony, apparently. This is how some researchers of colonialism in Western society thinks. So... What is also important uh, for uh, for people who don't know the, the difference uh, between Western colonialism and a special Russian one, uh, with the Russian one, it's kind of fine if you are have a separate government, which is not fine if you think if you don't think you're part of Russian culture. Russian culture in Russian in, in Russian states is seen as Russian language. So every time you as a country or you as a person or as a nation saying that you don't want to be part of Russian language, for them, it means that you want to be savages again and they will civilize you 
even if it's mean, mean raping and I don't know, killing you. So this is very important that um, if, I don't know, British uh, people didn't call Indian British people with the Russian idea, it's like the, the idea of Russia is just expanding. Like just Russia just became bigger. You are right, right now Russian, you're Russian, you're Russian. Like in Kazakhstan, for example, right now they're speaking Russian. Of course, it doesn't look like Russian. Of course, Russian people making this distinguish very well. You are not Russian. But if you're part of Russian culture, and of course they are, by the amount of movies, TV shows, all of that. So this is very important. Um, what else? Yes, I guess, and for language, I guess language is very important here as well, because if you don't have very distinguished uh, borders of your country, and if these borders are fluid and all the time changing, there is only one thing, there is not a lot of um, factors for you that define your country or culture. What does actually make you different from Russian person? You look the same, you have potato nose, you know, all of them have potato nose, let's, let's face it. You like sour cream, you have the same the same food without any spices. What is actually different? Different. And different in our case is only language. There is no other other ways to, to say that okay, I'm different. Like 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 face it. Um, this is the same for Belarus, because only language made may the distance. So that's why when you hear about oh Ukrainians are banning Russian culture, no, 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 no. There is not banning. There is people, I'm still a Russian speaker right, right now when I'm speaking with you, I'm translating this from Russian to English. Uh, but the idea that we need to save Ukraine by saving language, because there is no other way how we are different. I don't know, did I explain it well or not? Yeah. And I mean, another thing, and this is it's something that you specifically can speak towards, that there is a Russian imperialism context when it comes to Afghanistan as well. And so as it happens, you are from both worlds that can really speak to this to this aspect of it. So I don't know how much you want to share on this feel free. Uh, and then maybe we can get Romeo's uh, takes on this as well. Yeah, it was very similar idea with, the, with of, of course, not similar because nobody will say that Afghani people are Russian. This is understandable. But the idea is, again, a lot of Russian um, Communist Party. And OK, when I'm talking about USSR, I'm talking about Russian communist state because when you look at, um, at the at the idea of the culture, of course, you were like a lot of people, especially in Western societies, they think that um, communist, communist country was actually a very good idea, but just failed. No, 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 it wasn't a good idea. It was actually Russian state. The center of culture was only Moscow, which is very typical for all empires. You have the one place where everyone needs to go. If you want to be good at science, you need to go to Moscow. You need to have, have this metropole, like the idea of it. Um, everyone was speaking only Russian. You can speak your language, but like again, it's not civilized language. So it was the same basically as an empire, but just with red, with red sim symbol symbolism. So it was also the idea of um, civilization, of sharing communist ideas. So it's kind of the same. Like we're spreading good thing to other countries. It was the, the same idea with Afghanistan. We will spread. We will share our knowledge um, for our small brother. Um, and the idea that this small brother didn't want to to have this knowledge, and they had the problem with with uh, with Afghanistan. I guess it's also kind of um, sim like not as, but this is a good way to explain that Russia was aggress aggressive for centuries. Like it's it didn't start with Putin. It started. If you like Dostoevsky, just believe me, Dostoevsky is connected to imperialistic culture of Russia. It's the same with the, with Soviet times. So it's kind of ironic that. My father was running from Russian state, communist state. He came to another country and he still had like, you know, he still kind of had the same problem. And right now his son, who actually was five years old when war started in Afghanistan, he was drafted when he was 30 and he was mobilized again when he's 37. And he lost no, no eye. So and right now he's became a disabled person. So um, I guess for me, it's, um, let's talk about this. Because I guess this is something that not everyone understands right now. People think that this aggression is Putin's aggression. And this is just rapidly Putin became crazy. Because this is also what, what I want to ha um, kind of emphasize. That for a long time, uh, Russian state tried to build a very good image of Putin. For example, in, in the same TikTok, there was a lot of 
um, cute moments when when Putin was was hugging puppies. Like, yeah, we know that this is this is a joke, but we know that this actually have some image in our like. I I never seen Lebanese president with puppy. Like nobody nobody doing that. Or for example, at some point there was like a lot of how Putin is saying bold jokes. You know, like with Merkel how he's like bad. Like there is a lot of things. So I, I, I don't want to um, say that there is no way to try. There is image Putin as a very uh, strong leader, strong leader that fight for his country. So I guess we need, we need to say that this is not just rapid Putin aggression. This is very, um, with this very logical continuation of Russian culture that was there for centuries. And, Right now we're here, and we, if we won't stop, it just will go more further away. What I'm also interested in, what is definition of of Europe for Europe? Because Ukraine was Europe, and it wasn't Western enough. So when they will um, try to invade Poland, will it be Western enough or not Western enough? Like, where is the Western thing is, is stopping? So, yeah. A friend of mine, um, Adnan, who I know would listen to this for sure. So hi, Adnan. But um, he's, he's Bosnian, and he uh, is among those who kind of uh, were saying from the beginning, really like end of February, more or less, um, that like the, the longer this continues and the more images of Ukraine get associated with bombed out cities and with ruins, the more uh, psychological distance there will be between the average European and uh, what's happening, uh, Western European, in what's happening in, in Ukraine. And we saw this with Syria from the beginning, because I think the fact that it was in the Middle East, Arab world, blah, 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 it was easier for lots of people in the West to just associate a house or a city with ruins, was in fact, they were rendered into ruins. They were not ruins before 2011. They were actually normal cities like anywhere else. But it becomes easier to, to, to make that association. And recently, and this I think is like, it's disgusting, but it's also perfect. It's like a perfect symbol symbolism of everything that's wrong. You have a uh, Chinese comp- uh, Chinese production company, film company that is actually co-produced by none other than Jackie Chan, who many people don't know is a piece of shit. But he uh, is funding this movie that is actually being filmed in Syria in a destroyed. Uh, I think it's Aleppo. I don't remember where or Homs or something like in Syria um, to shoot a movie that describes. Uh, a heroic whatever of Chinese diplomats being rescued from Yemen. So as far as the average Chinese viewer is concerned, this is the logic that, that went into the production company, they won't know the difference between a bombed out uh, Syrian city and a bombed out uh, Yemen, Yemeni city. So the irony is that Yemen is destroyed largely because of the Saudis. I mean, the Houthis aren't innocent, but largely because of the Saudis. They are the ones bombing from the sky. And it looks similar to the average person who's going to watch that movie to the bombing that's been happening by the Russians and by the Assad regime over Syria, that same government that is obviously those governments allied with the with the Chinese uh, government. So it's kind of it's come full circle essentially, and that same psychological distance that the average Chinese person might have with Syria is the same distance it's as far away as Yemen, for example. And I think the risk now is that, and speaking of Bosnia, things are happening in Bosnia as well, but. I'm going to pin this because I actually want to say something on this. But um, so the further, the worse things get, essentially, and the longer it drags on, the more there will be this psychological distance. But speaking of Bosnia, you mentioned before, Romeo, like, you know, well, Germany has supposedly has, you know, at least recover or definitely has done more soul searching than than the average Brit or the average American or the average French. But honestly, I think the bar is very low. <laughs> but um, and that is true. But it, it, what, what it means is that it, again, trans, it gets translated into different ways. Like this, this authoritarian tendency, I think, is still there. It's not the same. I never want to make comparisons. But aspects of it are still there. And what's happening now in Bosnia is that you have this German, the high representative of Bosnia because of the Dayton Agreement. It's someone from the EU. So this, this guy, this time, is a German guy who's going to impose an election law that discriminates against uh, non constitutive quote unquote, minorities in Bosnia, namely... Roma and Jews, among other minorities in Bosnia. Now, if I came to tell you, hey, there's this German guy who is going to impose an election law that is going to discriminate against Roma and Jews, it doesn't sound very good. You know, there are echoes there. Again, not the same, but the echoes are there. (laughs) 
And so for me, it's it's a bit of that. It's the fact that it tends to happen. Like what gets what gets media attention and what doesn't. In in Bosnia, it's not getting media attention. So these things we can happen. In Ukraine, we know from the beginning. And honestly, I think Zelensky, as a media person, understood this from the beginning. And honestly, kudos to him on this. I'm not gonna lie. I was impressed that he managed to understand how the average Westerner things because yes he had to go to the fucking academy awards or whatever the fuck it was he had to do these things the vogue thing these things actually mattered i wish they didn't but they do and he understood that you need to maintain a spotlight because other than that it's very very quick for the average european or average western european specifically and and their governments especially to try and turn a blind eye to try and just sweep it under the rug to try and just appease and normalize and just let's move on let's just let's you know wish it away essentially you know, for a second, I wanted to, to circle back um, to Russian imperialism. Something you said, Miriam, really um, struck with me, uh, something that I think Westerners don't understand at all, um, especially the types that become Stalinists through TikTok. Um, this idea that the Soviet Union was a Russian empire. Um, when I was very little, and uh, I learned Russian like naturally i never took formal education in russian so i i in like i grew up in the us so i never read like russian literature no one ever forced me to remember like poems by pushkin or whatever the hell um which thank god for that but um when i was a kid and my uh great aunt was a huge, huge lover of russian um of russian literature we came our family is this kind of archetypical Soviet intelligentsia family. Um, and she, I, I remember this, this phrase that she used to told, tell me um, when I was struggling with Russian was that was, it went something like, even if I was a farmhand uh, in a village in Africa, I would still try and learn Russian because it is the language of Lenin. Um, and Miriam might, you might have heard this, um, th that before. Uh, and it really struck me, like, at the time, obviously, I didn't think of anything of it. It wasn't until really after I'd moved to Ukraine in 2014 um, that I understood the, the, the difference between being a Soviet person and being a Ukrainian. Because I grew up in, in basically a Soviet culture. My, my um, parents immigrated. Uh, right in what in ninety one, um, when we were all Soviet, and obviously the uh, as I said, I come from a family of Soviet intelligentsia. Uh, my grandparents are both professors, so it was it was very much ingrained that like this is just normal. This is just like yes, of course you should know Russian. It's the most beautiful, most civilized language ever. Of course, why wouldn't you know Russian? Like, why would you speak Ukrainian? Like, yeah, people from villages speak Ukrainian, but you're from this cultured family. Why would you speak Ukrainian? Um, and this idea that you, like, the, 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 this tie between Russia and culture and civilization, um, which is, is such a strong societal meme um, that it, even in parts of Ukraine, it still persists, um, despite all the evidence to the contrary, um, is not at all something that, that Westerners tend to associate with Soviet Union. They, they're like, oh, the empires are, are gone, the Bolsheviks came in, you know, the friendship between peoples. Um, but in reality, all the cultural memes that we were taught weren't uh, even communist memes. <laughs> they were just Russian imperial memes. Russia's the best. Moscow's the greatest city in the world. It has the best metro. It has the best infrastructure. It has the best universities. Um, one of my goals as a child um, for my grandmother was to have me um, uh, enroll in um, Kamoa, the the Moscow like governance university. Basically, we're all the the top Russian like uh, bureaucrats and diplomats. They come from this one university in Moscow, and my grandmother's goal was for me to also go there because I wanted to be a lawyer when I was a kid. Um, she's like, well, obviously you have to go here. <laughs> um, and it's, it, it's so difficult to talk and explain this particular understanding to Westerners that we're not talking about some amorphous, like communist country. 
it was just Russian. Yeah, it had some hammers and sickles, and people like to use the word worker a lot. But other than that, it was basically just purely Russian. Speaking any other language was considered like village speak, not just Ukrainian, but if you spoke Georgian or Armenian or Uzbek, and it, God forbid you had an accent because that just meant you're a barbarian, you're you're uncultured, you're barely human. So it's not even just speaking Russian, you had to speak perfect Russian. I, I When I was in um, college in the U.S., one of my classmates was um, Uzbek. And obviously her Russian was perfect. And I was always super curious, like, shouldn't she have an accent? Like, most people have accents, like Indians have accents when they speak English, right? They don't sound like they just stepped off the um, the set of a Shakespeare play. Uh, Americans obviously have accents when they speak English. Africans have aspect, aspect, bleh, accents when they speak French. Why is it that all of, like, the ex-Soviet republics, you had to speak perfect Russian? And anything less than that is con- was considered to be a degradation. And it drives me crazy because that, I think, is one of the key ways to truly like understand that Russia has been an empire this whole time. And this whole time it's been engaged in the business of erasing um, every cultural identity that isn't Russian, wherever it, its guns could reach. Um, and to understand that, you really need to to grasp this point that that's all like that's so much of what they were concerned with was selling this idea that Russia is a cultured country, of course. And then their soldiers go and castrate POWs on, uh, on telegram. Yeah. So I'll leave it to the, to, to the listener to decide how cultured Russia really is. I can only add quickly two things that, one thing it makes me laugh sometimes, and this is there's an Arabic expression called al-mudhak So like, what is what is funny is actually sad. So it's like both at the same time. Uh, but you know those memes and those posters, the Soviet posters that many people like tankies and whatnot and others share on the internet. It's like if you just have the exact same poster and just remove the Russian, the Cyrillic alphabet, and just make it in English or in French, what does that look like? You know, like, just just you have always have a white person who's in the center. You always have a white person who's at the head of. Okay, maybe maybe we'll put a black person there somewhere. It's okay, but like not at the front, not in the center. You know, put it on the, put it on the sides. What does that look like? What does it look? What does it sound like when you if you hear well, everyone had to learn the language, everyone had to learn English or French. What does that remind you of? Everyone had to speak with a perfect accent. You mentioned like the average Indian or American don't, don't speak like the English. Yeah, but the English tried. <laughs> they tried to make everyone speak the Queen's English, as it's called. They just failed. <laughs> they just were not good at it. And so people learned the language but kept their accents, essentially. But the impulse isn't that different. But again, if you, it's just that it's in a certain, it's in Cyrillic. It has like Soviet music is like nicer than British imperial music, you know, and that's enough. You know, some put some echo, some cho- cho- choirs here and there and, some nice imagery and, you know, a, a fist somewhere, I don't know, whatever it is. And that's, that's enough. It's like, it's a, it's memes. As you mentioned before, these are memes, even before the internet, they were memes. And now they just, they just get spread around differently. And now you can remix them on TikTok. But other than that, it's the, the impulse is sort of the same or the, the phenomenon is sort of the same. Yeah. And, you know, I just want to also that because, you know, I'm, I'm preparing this lecture. There's a very interesting phenomenon of there was actually hierarchies of, uh, of different nations in Soviet times. So, frankly speaking, Ukraine was next after Russian one. So we were kind of on the top. Second were uh, after us was like Belarusian people. And after that, nobody cares. And of course, the gypsies people are on the very bottom, like nobody. Chukchas and then the gypsies. So, um what is important, and they still have it right now, um, this is this idea that was um, kind of, I guess, connecting culture of modern Russia to like 20 years, uh, 200 years ago, uh, imperialistic Russia. So the idea of that, if you want to make a joke, you just need to say, so Russian, Ukrainian, of course, are different languages, but there were some specific sounds that world what, um, it's in Russian, it sounds like you know, and in Ukrainian, it's sho, um, sho. So if you will just remove this sh sound, and just put this sh sound, this will make this joke funny because Ukrainian language is a comical language. There is a lot of stuff like that. So right now, for example, Russian propaganda, uh, pro- 
oh my god, yeah, I want to say bad word, but anyways, Russian journalists, they were saying something like, um, if they want to humiliate, they are saying, saying something like Ukrainian uh, independence. What they're saying is незалежность. So they're taking Ukrainian word and making it sound funny. I read about it, that they were doing that 200 years ago with the same connotation that you will just take Ukrainian wor- uh, word and in Ukrainian, because it's not real language, their meaning of the world will, will be opposite because it's not real one. So when you say independence of Ukraine in this in this in, yeah, in this kind of Ukrainian language, it means that it's very dependent. And I was so shocked that again it was starting in the in the anecdotes and jokes in Russia, like in in Soviet time. It was very typical and very normal. So, and it's very interesting to hear that there is no racism in Soviet times, or for example. I'm seeing right now that because of Soviet time, all the country of post-Soviet time are not ready to feminism because people are thinking that feminism is something that they have in Soviet time. When you work in the in the fabric uh, or like I don't know, doing something eight eight hours after you come home and you cook for whole family. This is feminism, the an idea of post-Soviet countries. And when you say no, 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 it means that you work and you come at home and you work together or like. Like, you know, you, you can delegate. They're not used to that. So the idea is like, no, 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 I don't need feminism. I just want to, to relax and don't do work. So I, I every time I'm trying to emphasize to some Western, uh, I don't know, lefties that there was no feminism, actually. They're saying about that, but it wasn't true. So I guess it's also our um, our task to to say this thing because we, we know I mean, we're so used to it. It's so obvious for us that we don't even... Like every time we hear that Sauri is is having sympathy to communist Russia, we're like, what? Like, it's a joke. Like it, it couldn't be true. Like how? How you can? So I guess this is a gap between the knowledge, and we need to explain it better. Maybe. I will only add to that. If that's okay. That the closest equivalent to me is when I I see just random Westerners uh, say good thing about the Iranian government, and by any objective definition or by any like objective i don't know descriptions of what counts as right wing left wing far right far left the iranian government is pretty far right like by almost any any standard uh, the morality police that they have is straight out of an orwellian book like they quite literally have a morality police like it's not i mean they don't need it's just there but the other thing that's very similar is that essentially what i'm hearing is that well we didn't need feminism because we had communism and we didn't need feminism because we had this equality, blah, 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 blah. And in Lebanon, not just Lebanon, but especially Lebanon and kind of Iran in some, some cases, like we don't need feminism. We, we have uh, Islamism. You know, we don't need feminism. We have this other structure that just, it provides equality, but just don't talk about it too much. Like just, just you know, it just, it, it, it functions. You know, it does, it does its job. It's okay. We're good enough. We don't need to be like, whatever it's usually also the 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 discourse is like this this feminism is just you know in an, in a an, a import from the west essentially and you know ignoring lebanese feminists or iranian feminists obviously completely erasing them or just saying like you know they're just naive or whatever but so it's it's interesting to me that the the specific vocabulary changes and it's a different language and it's a different context and different history and whatnot but that these underlying tendencies that seems to travel quite a bit. Like it's something that I, I see in different contexts. Again, it's not always the same, but it's so, certain tendencies definitely seem to be, you know, travel across context and across time for sure. Yeah, especially it, it, in a lot of ways, it seems that despite the, the different kind of cultural connotations and the different language, people are still saying the same thing. Um, and, and this especially applies to feminism or any kind of LGBTQ rights. That is, like, you will hear so often that this is a Western import. Um, and you're like, how how is this kind of universal value that people should like maybe work together? Is how how is that a Western value? Doesn't isn't that just base logic? Like. And and you hear it so often. I mean, in feminism, it's in feminism at least. Um, at least in Ukraine, like there is the the stereotype of the strong like woman, the strong matriarch. So 
for some aspects of, of feminism, and I want to be very clear, this is just some aspects of feminism. Um, it's like, it, it's easier to accept. Um, but when you get to stuff like LGBTQ rights, like all of that goes out the window. And this is purely some Western decadent Western import. And you're like, but it's the 21st century and the Soviet Union has been gone for 30 years. What are you, what are you talking about? You, you want to be in the West. Like you, you want West, you, everyone talks about how Western products are better than like post-Soviet ones. Everyone wants to get salary in dollars. Everyone wants to work for some cool Western company. Everyone uses Western websites. What do you mean it's a Western import? Everything you have is a Western import. And more importantly, everything you want is also Western import. But this specific thing is bad because it's Western. Uh, You're skipping a step there in your logic. The joke of um, that is common among you know people who don't like Hezbollah in Lebanon is that they will criticize America Shaitan, uh, America the Devil, all day long, but would be very happy to buy American products in U.S. dollars. And there is there is a disconnect there in one way or another, but it doesn't whatever it doesn't matter. Listen, it's been it's it's an hour and a half, and obviously with these kinds of episodes, I can go on for like five hours. But uh, the podcast doesn't allow me more than two hours. On, uh, otherwise, I could literally not even upload it on the website. <laughs> but um, what I want to do before we kind of slowly wrap up and then we get into the book section later is just talk and, you know, we'll, we'll have to summarize just because it's not possible to go too much into it. But as it happens, like I, this, you know, uh, Romeo, you're, you're yourself part uh, South Asian. I don't know if I'm exactly, but you had mentioned it once. And of, of course, uh, Mariam, you mentioned the, the Afghan origins. What can you tell us, if anything at all? Because I let me let me put it this way: when when there is a situation like a war right now, there is obviously a tendency in a society to kind of come together, and you know that's like in in the in the UK is that infamous the Blitz spirit, right? Like you know we come together, we'll t- all tighten our belts, we'll you know blah blah blah, all of that stuff. And of course, that's good, and that's necessary, and that's important, and all of that stuff. And what tends to happen in a situation which is very natural is that internal differences in a society, internal tensions, internal uh, problems, you know, what whatnot, tend to kind of ca- be put aside, be put away, you know, tempo- at least temporarily. And again, this is normal. It's It happens in any, literally every context. I, I know, for example, from the Lebanese example, that in the, in the 80s, even though Hezbollah was assassinating communists, there were time where Hezbollah and the communists were allies because they were fighting Israel. You know, there was, you know, they, they, you find ways to create, to accept contradictions and tensions and whatever. That's just the reality of it. But given that, as it happens, both of you come from mixed backgrounds in Ukraine, um, what are certain insights that you feel that you've had in the past few months that maybe other Ukrainians don't have, or definitely that, let's say, Westerners don't have, if I can put it that way? Maybe you can start if you want. No, you can go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> As you can see, it's not a very easy topic. To... Um, it just, you know, right now I feel like it's a very complicated topic to talk about um, because I felt very lonely every time in Ukraine when I just tried to discuss it. And because Ukrainians, and sorry, Ukrainians, don't please kill me for that, um, they are mostly denying that they have racism. Racism is something that Russians have, Russians have not us. There is no ra- there is no racism because you don't see it, because there is a reason why you don't see race, <laughs> racism. Um, and every time you try to explain some problem with racism, people are like, nah, don't, like you are overreacting. Or like, and because you didn't have other people who look the same as you, um, so you didn't have any like support or like, you know, another ethnical group. You feel like you're actually only one drama queen here. Um, for example, in my family, we were taught that we need to wash ourselves so like so carefully because people assume that we are stink like all the time. And I remember my brother was saying that to me that I need to wash my face so much because, again, you know, uh, when you have small pigmentation, like, of course, you have different like some part of your face is more white, some part is not. And my brother was saying, like, you need to wash it so hard so it will be the same one, the same color. So people won't assume that you are dirty. My father all the time felt super awkward in all restaurants because 
all of these forks. Like he wasn't sure, like he was shaving, I don't know, maybe twice per day. So nobody will assume that he is barbarian or something like that. And of course, right now, after I start to realize, okay, what was happening, I try to, to share that to my friends, but this is not a very easy topic to share. Um, I guess for Western countries, it's like more typical discussion, but for Ukraine is not because like we don't have so many immigrants, we don't have so many refugees. Um, so sometimes, you know, I remember I, when I was sharing these stories to my Ukrainian friends, they were like, but you don't even look not Ukrainian. You're almost white. And I'm like, this is... <laughs> Even like their thing is fine. You you, you like, have no idea how much how many times one of my friends has said, "But Uroma, you're you're like almost you're basically white." Yes. Like let's compare our arms. I just got done tanning. Look, we're the same. I'm like what? Yes. And you're like, no, it doesn't work that way. I'm not became Ukrainian only because you named me Ukrainian. Like, and um, so you know this is I guess. Oh my god. Uh, yeah, there is like a lot of very bad stories. Of course, I- I'm talking about everyday racism. I'm, t- I'm not talking about the the people who want to beat you. Like, just just put these people aside. So this thing is like a big problem. So we're like, oh, you know, Mary, but like, so in Ukrainian, we have this thing that Ukrainian standard of beauty is um, a black eyes and black brows. And everyone's like, oh, you're such a typical Ukrainian. Like, it's a joke. Like, you're such a typical Ukrainian girl with brown eyes and brown brown uh, eyebrows. And I'm like, this is just. Yeah, so this is a bit, um, I'm just hoping that one day, no, I'm not hoping, I know it will happen because we cannot stop globalization, and the wrong mail that there will be more people like us, <laughs> and people just need to to deal with this. So, but yeah, right now you feel like you're a minority of the minorities because you don't have other people like you. And um, I also <laughs> saying that this is a good way of reaction and bad. So. My reaction is bad because I'm trying to emphasize this. I'm saying, guys, this is not good. Don't react. Like, don't do this. I don't know. When I was saying that at um, at school, we had like this preparation for the army for guys, and we had uh, Kalashnikovs. So it was a, basically the best jokes to give me Kalashnikov and make a picture, and send it to, to social media. And I was saying that this was like it's not a good thing to do. And people are saying, yeah, you know, Mary, but you will overreact because I have another friend. He's like he's half Syrian. And he's, he's a big black. And when I see him, I just dr- give him some bananas and we're just laughing. I'm like, <laughs> this is not okay. So people assume that this is my problem. And I hope that at some point we will just change that. And we discuss this with brothers that we will put this topic after war. Not now. Yeah, one of the things I've noticed, especially um, when I was a kid and I would go to Ukraine, is... People assume you're a foreigner up until like people would assume I would a former I was a foreigner up until I opened my mouth and my Russian is more or less unaccented. Um, like obviously it's not perfect Russian. I mean I spent most of my life in the U.S. Um, but more or less my Russian sounds native. So um, actually when when I just moved here in fourteen I would go to like a bar or a club or something. And girls would be interested in me up until the moment I would speak in Russian because that's when I transfer from being some exotic American guy to just a buddy, just just a guy, just a dude. Um, which on the one hand is nice. On the other hand, people still make a lot of assumptions. Like, um, I, I can't tell you how many times like I've gotten the I've gone through the conversation of oh where are you from well I was born in Vienna no where are you really from I'm like I was born in Vienna I just told you and they're like no no where are your parents from well my mom's from Vienna and they're like and then they're confused <laughs> like the <laughs> the the wheels in their head don't quite don't quite click and if I'm feeling like really like really nice i'll go okay my dad's from bangladesh um but i was born in Vienna. <laughs> as you can see i can speak russian um it's my native language and uh people don't really understand why that's an offensive question they they don't see how like being but where are you from really is is hurtful like there's a lot of stuff that, that ukrainians don't really understand and this idea of oh like you're just overreacting is a huge part of it um, because Ukrainians don't want to like confront that, that thing, that, that part of Ukrainian culture. 
Um, even when, like, my wife is from a small village outside of Kiev. Um, she is as Ukrainian culture, country girl, like, as they come. Um, her village has a population of, like, a thousand people. And her parents work the farm. That's what they've done for their entire lives. Um, and that's what she did for most of her life as well. Um, and when, like, I, I went there for the first time, I was, like, incredibly, I, I don't want to say cautious, I was apprehensive that I'm going to, like, really, really stand out. Luckily, her parents turned out to be, like, completely fine um, and accepted me, which I'm greatly indebted to. Um, but there's always this this apprehension. And one of the things I will say, one of the negative kind of portions of this war um, was I, I went through a checkpoint near my apartment the other day. And I'm in a cab, the, um, the like, guard motions the cab to pull over, he starts checking the documents, um, I pull up my passport uh, on, like, the, the mobile app or whatever, and he's looking at it, he's like, so, so, he's like, uh-huh, where do you live? For some reason, they always ask that, I'm like, well, I live in, like, Vishneva, it's the, like, suburb that we, we this is the checkpoint that separates Vishneva and Kiev, um, and he's like, when did you get your your Ukrainian passport? I'm like, excuse me? And then he looked at a bit, um, a bit more and he's like, Oh, this is from birth. I'm like, yes. What does it matter? Like, I'm obviously not Russian. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Um, so there, there is like a bit of parochialism, I guess you could call it. Um, that comes out, but at the same time, I do want to stress this cause I, I mentioned this a lot, um, is like, I grew up in New York um, and legitimately I have experienced less institutional racism here, like harassment from the cops or people like a lot closing their windows when I walk past, um, that happened a lot. Um, like that has happened noticeably, noticeably way less than that ever happened in the U S even in New York, which you'd think is like the bastion of liberalism or whatever. Um, so I think mostly the, the the problem with racism will more like will, will eventually fade away because Ukraine isn't wedded to racism as a core concept of their, uh, of, of our culture. It's, it's, it's not really a thing. Um, like Russians love pointing out how anti-Semitic Ukrainians are, which I always found hilarious because we're talking about Russians here. Um, Russians are just, they are wedded to racism as a cultural value. It is one of the foundational aspects of being Russian, is that you're an Orthodox Slav. And while you do have aspects of that in Ukraine, it's nowhere near as pronounced. Um, and especially for, like, Jews, they're, they are also more or less not really touched or considered to be any, like, some kind of other generally speaking, obviously, um, there's still, I don't want to say that this country has no anti-Semitism because that's obviously not true. No, I mean, generally speaking, people don't care. The conversation is important because there's obviously a nuanced difference between saying there is racism and there is anti-Semitism and there is whatever homophobia, transphobia, etc. in our country and saying this is inherently who we are and we are, you know, inherently wrong or inherently, not inherently, but like, something fundamental about who we are is wrong because obviously that you get into a very dark slippery slope which is basically what putin has been saying in it already but like what is true and this is like a final small comment it's not what is true that in the west broadly speaking there is some kind of conversation around race that is uh, more pronounced at the very least than let's say in the arab world which is what i, I can speak about uh, speak to confidently it really depends where and it depends to what extent uh, are you allowed to pu to push it essentially like for my my example or the ones i'm most familiar with are like the uk france and italy uh switzerland to a lesser extent but especially those three and in france you would have some conversation around it but for example the limitation has to do with religion rather than race but it doesn't mean that there is no racialization it doesn't mean that there is no authorization on the basis of race it just means that the vocabulary that is used is different uh in italy it's actually very common to use terms like he looks Italian or he doesn't look Italian. And what's kind of very 
weird is that I've been in a situation in Italy many, many times, because I've been there many times with family connections and stuff, where the person assumes I'm Italian because many people from the Mediterranean kind of look the same. Um, assume I'm Italian until I open my mouth and I have an accent and I'm clearly not Italian. Or assume immediately that I can't possibly be Italian, even before opening my mouth. And I've never quite understood what is, what is it. Like, is it the length of my beard? Maybe if I've shaved, if I've not, maybe if I've shaved more, I look from the south. I'm not in, because I've been in a situation where it's like they made a comment about how light my skin, how like dark my skin was. And I'm like light, dark, whatever the description of my skin is. I'm not sure. I'm pretty but, sure I've seen Sicilians with darker skin than you. That's exactly what I mean is that I, I've been in a situation where I was with someone who is like an Italian or Sicilian or whatever, who has darker skin than I do but who's commenting on the darkness of my skin. And I was like, I, I'm, what, do I, what do I do in this situation? Have you looked at yourself, you know? But this is not uncommon. It's a, it's a very odd, very parochial, maybe that's the term. It, it can translate itself into overt racism when it's like someone who is like of Af- African origin, let's say, or who is Afro-Italian or whatnot, then they, they definitely bear the brunt of, of these kinds of things. Whereas for me, it's more like, I don't know. On maybe on a good day I look Italian, on a bad day I don't. It's very like flip of the coin kind of situation. But it's a very interesting thing. I, I actually find it very like fascinating that in I've been in a situation where yeah, it's like yeah, obviously you're Italian, and other situations like obviously you're not. What are you talking about? It's like I, what has changed since yesterday? I'm still the same. Nothing else has changed. Anyway, whatever. Wanted maybe to kind it's of before and after coffee. Maybe it's before and after coffee. Yeah, but. Whatever. I'm not going to start about Italian breakfast culture now. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I just, last thing that I want to add yeah, yeah, also, yeah. that for 20 years, I was lying that I'm Indian origin, not Afghani origin. So it was also interesting thing about me. So first of all, it's very important. So nobody will think you're a gypsy. Oh, my God. This is like, you know, Romeo, you for sure, you know what I feel like. You're just like, oh, my God, please don't assume that I'm gypsy. And, uh, of course, when you became older, you don't understand how this is a bullshit concept, but at some point I realized I'm ashamed to say that I'm Afghani because again, people, a lot of were at war and maybe I'm talking to a guy and his father was dead there and I, and I feel guilty. So I was for, for a long time, I was saying that I'm Indian, I have Indian and everyone's like, oh, nice. And they start to sing some songs because this is basically what people know about India from, from Ukraine. We, we didn't have Hollywood, so we had Bollywood, and then people have a lot of sympathize to 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 Indian men. So maybe that's why my mom married my husband, my, my father. I don't know, but anyways, that's why my mom married my father. <laughs> <laughs> so this is like another thing for me that uh, it was actually also kind of hard because again, Indian is kind of nice exotic. Afghanistan is not nice exotic. Like it's it, it's it's barbaric. It's like one of my teacher, a professor. It was like uh, um, it was deontology for lawyers. I was studying law uh, at first degree, and I was like talking about LGBT rights. And my people in my in my group they, they were disagree with me. And at some point, prof- professor told me, "Oh, Maram, it's so it's so interesting that with your heritage and your with your roots, you're talking so much." And I was like. Oh, nice compliment. And wait, wait a minute. Uh, so like, because if I will say that I'm Indian, people won't assume that. But since I'm a Afghani, it means that uh, I'm not allowed to speak or something like that. So it's also interesting that there is all, like, like there is like levels of um, ethnicity that's cool or not. So Italian is cool. And, but maybe when you're Middle Eastern, it's not so cool anymore. In France, you have good exotic and bad exotic. You're good exotic if from Lebanon, like we're kind of fetishized, like among the other Arab groups, we're like, oh, it's like, it's fine. We like you, you have good food or whatever it is. And with, um, or with Japanese, for example, like Japanese people are fetishized in Europe, you know, for the, or South Koreans for that matter, much more so than the average Chinese, for example. They're like, yeah, yeah, you have K-pop or you have anime or like, we like your food, you know, whatever. It's like some, there's something, there's something that happens that, that shifts. There's a hierarchy of, of threats essentially like how likely are you to be disregarded or how likely are you to be fetishized and like because fetishization is a problem as well but is that it doesn't have the immediate threats let's say or the immediate discrimination or what have you okay on the on that uh relatively light topic uh i'm going to ask you now mariam if that's okay to recommend uh the books that you wanted to recommend so we can sort of wrap it up on that note we'll go slightly over two hours but it's okay i'll edit some of it out it's fine uh so okay. go for it 
so I guess, of course, if you want to know, to know more about more than movie Braveheart about Ukrainian relationship with Russia, I guess it's important to read Eva Thompson book uh, about imperial knowledge, which is basically talk about Russian imperialism in Russian literature. So people will understand that there's actually roots in that. Um, also, if you want to to read something uh, more patriotic and more to find more information about how how long is the history of Ukrainian uh, fight for freedom, I guess I need to say that you should try to read Shevchenko, Taras Shevchenko. Uh, he wrote Kobzar. This is kind of a very known book. But also, if it's too long for you, you can try to uh, to read his poem Katerina, which is, starts with something like people. If you want to have love, don't have love with Russian people. It is basically talk about Russian soldiers, of course, not Russian people. And um, um, my last book will be just one, one of my favorite books. It's um, Max Stirner. Um, oh, no, it's Max Frisch, but book called Stiller. Yeah, that's it. And if I need, I can give you a link for the books, for these books. That's amazing. Okay, any uh, sort of like uh, final thoughts? Where can people find you online? That sort of thing. Romeo, you as well. Um, go for it. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter. I'm tweeting uh, a lot, and, I, and I'm trying to uh, tweet with without frustration, but it's hard. Um, and I have Instagram, but Instagram banned me um, for last two months. So I'm trying to have my new uh, my new account on Instagram. I'm talking a, lot, a little bit more in Ukrainian also, but there is English speaking posts. So. As for me, I am also on Twitter. You can find me at Romeo Gradsky. If you don't know how to spell that, good luck. It's gonna um, it's gonna be in the title of the episode or whatever. <laughs> there you go. There you go. If they don't um, find it, that's just laziness. You can also listen to my podcast, which is a lot easier to spell. It's called Ukraine Without Hype, where me and uh, my my co host we we talk about Ukraine news because we're journalists and we're we live in Ukraine. <laughs> And I've been a guest on that podcast. Yes, you have, Joey. You have. <laughs> Highly recommend that episode. Joey's a, a fantastic guest and a fantastic speaker. Thank you. <laughs> so, okay, you two. Uh, all, all that's left is for me to thank you for this just under two hours long conversation, which is fantastic. Thank you. I don't have to edit as much now. But uh, thank you two for doing this. And it will be out a week from when we're recording it. So the first Friday of August. So, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks for having us. The Fire These Times is hosted by myself, Joey Ayoub. I am also its producer, researcher, writer, and sound editor. If you want to help turn this project into a full-time job, please head out to patreon.com slash times to support it. These episodes are part of a bigger project, which includes resources, a newsletter, and eventually YouTube video essays as well. As always, thank you for listening and take care.